Thank you, Sasha. So let me first uh, start by introducing you, Sasha. So who is Sasha? Sasha is a development coach uh, who helps people and businesses strive. Uh, when did I met uh, Sasha here, actually, uh, in Singapore, in this training room, uh, during a training uh, session, while Sasha uh, was following the coach certification program, and when she entered, and during the training, I can tell you, our presence was magnificent, oh. <laughs> uh, full of wisdom and uh, eloquence from indeed the room. And as I mentioned, of course, I'm French, so I always like uh, uh, envy a lot of British people with such a beautiful uh, accent. So who's Sasha? Sasha uh, was born in Bahrain to mixed Chinese and British parents. She graduated from Cambridge University with a degree in law and social and political science. And Sasha enjoyed a successful career with international financial institutions in New York, in London, and Hong Kong. And since leaving the financial markets, she has consulted with and coached private and corporate clients, including business owners, investors, leaders, corporations, and also niche boutiques. Sasha takes a developmental and holistic approach in her work and she focuses on mindset build, self-management, and mindful leadership. And today we're here to discuss about the CEO mindset. Thank you very much, Sasha, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, everybody, now for taking the time as well. Uh, so we have a, a discussion with this fire. Right? <laughs> I hope you appreciate that it's a proper fireside chat. Uh, of course, uh, we want to hear you inside your questions as well. So feel free uh, to let us know whenever you uh, uh, want to ask anything. And use the chat as well. Uh, uh, we'll make sure that uh, we'll uh, take questions from the chat. So let's get started. So, Sasha, can you tell me a bit more about yourself? It's it such an amazing intro. It made me sound extraordinary. Um, so thank you very much, Geraldine. Thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of my professional CV, if you like. Um, I think what would be helpful here is kind of explaining how I got into the coaching piece and why the CEO mindset and how it became really important I felt, on, on my personal journey and then why I share it with, with people. Um, my career gave me a great opportunity to study leaders, study business owners, how they make decisions, um, the type of people they are, who is impactful, and how they are impactful, and that can be both positive and negative, right? So that was a great learning journey. Um, then working after leaving the, the dealing floor and under stockbroker, uh, and moving into consulting and helping business owners, which they, they just did for my old career. I left Rockets to have children. Um, so, but I kept in contact and, and people asked me to come forward and help and advise. I increasingly saw how mindset was getting in the way of business performance um, and of team performance and of team retention. And so that's where coaching increasingly entered the work that I was doing. And we just kind of remember, but I think it was just three years ago that I got certified with Go Master Coach and decided to focus on coaching really uh, full time. The CEO mindset journey. Actually, Geraldine's a part of that too. You asked me in preparation of the talk, right? A little yeah. bit about some powerful and pivotal moments in the CEO journey. And I, I would have thought about it. There's one very positive and there's one that was kind of negative but part of the journey. And I'll start with that because it was with Geraldine in a coaching session with Geraldine or a mentoring session with Geraldine that she was um, doing with me while I was getting my, my ACC certification. And I was talking about wanting to be CEO of my coaching business. And Geraldine asked me, so tell me about Sasha the CEO. And I burst into tears. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. I got super emotional. And 
was really overcome by grief, which was a real surprise. Um, and I realized that I was mourning the CEO that I felt I had been in my previous life. And my brain was offering me the thought, well, you lost it, you'll never get it back. That was you, like, you've got to start over. It's a long struggle. You know, you're in your 40s, how are you going to pull that off? That was a lot of what my, the thoughts of my brain was offering. Um, so that was quite a moment, Geraldine, and I sort of left the session with quite a lot to think about. Uh, and, but happily, one of my teachers is a fellow called uh, Jeremy Hunter, who I would really recommend if he looks up. He uh, works at the Peter Drucker Management Institute, and he does a lot of work of, uh, on transitions and de 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 developmental stages through life. Uh, and the grieving process that needs to happen as we make what transit, transition from one process to another. We grieve how we express who we are, but it doesn't change who we are. And so at that moment, and through, with Jeremy's teaching, I realized that actually we are all CEOs. In as much as we make daily decisions in our lives, we're all our own CEO. When you decide what time you get up in the morning, what food you put in your mouth, where you go to work, what you wear, who you spend your time with. And then the bigger decisions, where you send your children to school, which life partner you choose, all of that, we're our own CEOs. And so having gone through that grieving process, then I had this wonderful realization that, hang on, I am CEO. Um, which was affirmed very nicely in a huge argument that I had with my husband. When <laughs> he was, uh, we were talking about, I said, I was explaining to him that I felt the need to make a big decision. Um, and we were we were discussing that in a heated fashion and he made a suggestion and the words came out of my mouth. Why would I make that decision as CEO of my life? So it was really hugely empowering actually. And that was when I realized that a lot of the work that I do with businesses and business owners then becomes very, very applicable for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha, CEO of your life. So, how would you describe a CEO mindset? Mm. Okay, if I may, I'll share like some first principles, yes, and then, and then my perception of the CEO mindset. So, we're all CEOs, and there are three ways, three key elements to understanding the CEO brain: our prefrontal cortex and how that interacts with our primitive brain. Right. So, first is your self concept. Essentially, who you believe yourself to be, your core values, your beliefs, the behaviors with which you show up, and then the results that you create in your life. It's essentially your self concept. The second element to that, to the, the CE, understanding the CEO brain, would be your decision making protocols. How you make decisions in your life. And as I said, we make decisions every day, and most of them we do that on autopilot. It's not a thought through process. So, Understanding your default decision-making protocols is, uh, is an important part. And then the third part is a concept that I call congruency, which is a little bit complex. I hope we get a chance to talk about it today, but it's extremely powerful. And it can really be understood as how consistently your self-concept and your decision-making protocols are applied across the various aspects of your life. The more consistently they are applied, the greater the congruency with which you show up, the more powerfully you self-express, and therefore the greater impact that you're able to create, for better or worse. So those are the sort of three elements that I'm saying the CEO brain. Most of that is subconscious. We don't think about it. It's just what we've grown up with. Inherited schema, stories, the NLP filters, all of that, right? When we're developing the CEO mindset, we are essentially deciding to be very intentional and to develop who we want to be and how we want to do it. Using those three key constructs that I discussed, mm -hmm. and then there's a process for, for doing that. All right, awesome. So three construct self-concept, decision making protocol, and congruency. All right. And you talked about uh, intentional models as well. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think with a lot of what I just talked about, you know, we start from the premise and for all the coaches in the room, you know, we understand how much of behavior is unintentional 
default learned, not thought about. And the power of coaching to, to transform the results of the experience of the world when we become intentional, when we become purposeful. So using models like the self-concept, um, using models based in cognitive behavioral therapy, we can start to understand how our brain is working. Firstly, understand how it's working, perhaps against us, not for us, and then figuring out which of the key thoughts, feelings, actions that we need to be experiencing and creating in order to have the results that we want in the world. So that's really where these intentional things come Would you mind walking us through one of those? Uh, yeah. Uh, Struct Yeah, sure. I think um, self concept is, a, is it sort of comes later on, but there's um, it's actually it's not my model. It was a model created by the Life Coach School, so by a lady called Brooke Castillo. It's available for you. Really check it out. It's um, based in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's super powerful because it's very simple. And it's very easy to understand, to be able to watch your brain with it and how it's impacting your business. So starts with circumstances. Circumstances are always neutral. They have no meaning other than what we think about them. Right? So death is neutral. The fact that, that you know, there was a car crash is neutral. The fact that I'm here today is neutral. What I think about being here today is what gives it me. I'm really happy, I'm excited, I'm curious, all of that. So my thoughts create these feelings of happiness, excitement, curiosity. That will impact then the actions that I take while I'm in this room. How much I engage, how much I choose to speak, how open I am to questions that come along, how much I listen to. Geraldine, how much eye contact I make, the tone of my voice. All of those actions then create the result that we'll experience or I will experience in this room. How connected I get to be with you. How well I get to share my ideas. What I get to learn from you guys. Um, so that's the that's a model for, for looking at how we think. Yeah, very interesting. So look at the circumstances from a neutral perspective. Um, uh, and then depending on the meaning, give, uh, it will create some thoughts and some feelings uh, uh, and that you will take actions will create results. Correct, perfect. Yes. Okay. Is that okay? Awesome, very interesting. Uh, if you go back go back to the CEO mindset, would you mind sharing a success story? Um, um, yeah, yeah, I had, well, there are so many. Um, there's one, uh, I had a business owner come to me. She it was a small business, probably about at the time, about 20 employees. And she came because she was feeling really overwhelmed. There was a lot going on in her business at the time. Uh, she had problems with staff retention. She was experiencing quite a high turnover of staff. Um and was just you. If things had thought to be not in a happy place and she really felt like she was firefighting an, an awful lot of the time. So we work particularly with the self-concept with her. And um, it was a great recentering exercise because she'd been spending so much time spinning the plates, running around firefighting, that she'd lost sight of exactly her values in showing up as a boss, what the values of the business were that she was building or had built and wanting to expand. And so using a self concept model to reconnect with what are my values here? What are the values of the business? What are my core beliefs? What are the core beliefs of the people that work? How do we then show up behaviorally with compassion, with listening, with understanding? What results then do we look to create in the world? Well, these opportunities for engagement, you know, these employee events. Um, I sit down and spend time with my employees and have conversations with them. And I said to her, when was the last time you sat down and shared any of this with your staff? And she was like, not forever. So we, in coaching, sort of developed a program or a system for her to, to start to share, reshare that with herself and then with her staff. And 
six months later, I got a wonderful letter from her. She was just saying, I now work with my dream team. People left the company been asking to come back. Headcounts increased, you know, by 50%. Um, people are not leaving. And we're doing all these amazing things. And I have all these PR opportunities now that I'm, I'm also kind of looking for. So that was really nice as far as the business goes. But I think part of what we were going to talk about today was, you know, the congruence. Mm -hmm. So showing up like that in her business, she was then able to show up at home in the same way. Oh, how, what are my values here at home? Because the business is hers, it's the same. I want balance, I want compassion, I want understanding, I want listening. Suddenly her relationship with her son improved. Then when situations where she would be fighting with her husband about who got the office space or who was looking after the kids, those started to improve. Then how she was spending her free time, she suddenly found that she was getting back into doing the cooking course and hobby that she put on hold for 12 months and hadn't been able to find time to do. And then the conversations she was having at the cookery course and the people that she was meeting were creating opportunities for collaboration that were feeding back into her business. So the congruency with which she was then able to show up in the world was creating exponential impact that was felt across the board. And um, that was really important. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting, yeah. very interesting. So that's an amazing, successful story. How about uh, obstacles and challenges? And how do you help people uh, embrace this new mindset, uh, although they face challenges to do it? Have yeah. you ever been in this situation when you can do a resistance or? Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, the most resistance couldn't do it. Okay. I'm just not ready. Needed the stories that there's something wrong with me. There's that I can't, I can't get there. It's, you know, still this immunity to change, which is a, uh, a system that it created by a couple of great American um, practitioners. But yes, uh, it is challenging. And I think it can be really overwhelming to consider ourselves as our own CEOs. And I think that a massive obstacle is when people start to think, well, you know, what's a CEO? I need to have vision. I need to have purpose. I need a mission statement. I need all these amazing things and they're really hard to come up with. And I'm just, excuse my language, fucking running around in circles trying to survive, right? So why I like the self-concept model and why I like that um, the life coach school model that I showed you is it really breaks it down into what becomes meaningful and personal to me and what are the steps that I can take right now. So when we start to build the self-concept, we look at what matters to me, what are my values, what are my core beliefs for myself? And we just start with that. How do I want to show up today? What matters in my most important relationships? And from there, we can go about, well, these are the behaviors then, these are my goals that as, as a result of those behaviors. And when we can start with small P for purpose, when we can start with a small C, a C and O, and facilitate that gradual build up then into the grand vision, that um, it's a very nurturing way to go about doing some really big work. Okay, so this is the way you would approach huh, when you feel that's uh... Stronger, stronger resistance and yeah. break it down. Yeah, break it down into the bite-sized pieces. But I think also as coaches, it's we need to be. You know, a lot of clients come to coaching lacking self-belief, and I do think that as coaches, our job is to believe for them. Right? We wouldn't coach if we didn't believe that everybody can be great and every human is infinitely worthwhile and capable of so much more than we could possibly imagine, right? Um, so sometimes that requires us to be willing, yeah, to be willing to believe more than our clients and to be willing to risk the relationship in order to be that radically honest and grow their capabilities and capacities. And I do think that that is an important piece oh. of being fully committed to coaching. That's a very important one, very difficult one though. Mm. How do you manage to be radical, radically honest in your mind? I'd love to hear your ways of Yeah, so I think in terms of my coaching process, yes. um, 
really clear about that upfront and set out expectations both verbally in, in uh, the consult or the pre-coaching call if somebody wants to explore coaching and talk about that. Um, if they agree to coaching, then um, explicitly stated in the contract. And in our first session, again, reminders of, okay, this is the start of coaching, this is where things go. However, you know, coaching requires uncomfortable conversations. It requires for me to be very honest with you. I will always ask permission. And if today's not the day, that's okay. Or if this is going to an area where you don't want to discuss, that's okay. But it is a big thing. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, talking about uh, difficult conversation and the CEO mindset, how does this mindset make room for our vulnerabilities, our emotions? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I kind of shared that a little bit with you in terms of my my rediscovery yes. of my CEO mindset. One thing that I would say about it again is, especially coming from the because I've worked with so many business owners with the business development project that then includes development of themselves as leaders of those businesses, right? There can often be the expectation or the assumption that there's no room for emotion in business, and particularly for women. Uh, and I think that that is a misconception. And what I find is when I work with quite a lot of senior leaders, they find it very hard to access their emotions within the context of the problems and the dilemmas and the situations that we're talking about, because they spent so long ignoring, burying, or not paying attention. So this is where I, I've chatted with you a bit about Geraldine about somatic exercises. Mm -hmm. And really starting off with phys physically, where, do, where, do, where are you feeling this in your body? How is this showing up? And not even when we talk about it, but you know, where are you with your sleep? Where are you with your digestion? Where are, so this holistic approach, yes. because those suppressed emotions will will be expressing themselves in all sorts of surprises. So, so a lot of the burnout, um, a lot of the stress, a lot of the physical symptoms that I see show up with are really unexpressed emotions. That's what, what we find. Mm -hmm. um, that model, again, the high school model that I, I talked to you guys about, this is my circumstance. What am I thinking about it? So, an example. Let me think. Um, does anybody plan an example of a situation where they're feeling a little bit stuck right now? That they're willing to share? Anna? Um, so, we discussed in the book. Um, I'm basically like trying to get my job and I'm stuck. Like, should I leave it and then you propose something else? Then I get confused and I'm in this circle for a while. Okay, so I don't know if everybody heard, but trying to leave your job, considering options, thinking about it, can't make a decision, and then come back to thinking, well, maybe I should stay with my job. Yeah, exactly. And going round in a round in a loop. Okay, so the circumstance is your job. You're thinking at the moment, I want to leave my job. Because um, just not and there's no way aligned that's what I want to do. It's not very clear what I want to do, and I know that it's not aligned with any options that I have. Okay, so I'm not happy. My job does not align with what I want to do. Okay. okay. Anything else? Um, I think the environment does not align with. Values. So I feel that I need to change my truth in order to fit in. That's like not acceptable. Okay. So this environment doesn't align with my values. If I want to fit in here, I have to change my truth. That's not acceptable to me. What's your emotion when you think that? Um, I feel. It, it feels that like it's the right thing to actually be changing um, in order to like fit into one place just because that's what it's right in. So I have positive feeling. Yeah, positive, but so you feel empowered by the thought I shouldn't be changing my my truth. 
that's one part of your model. The previous thoughts in terms of, I don't, that my value, this isn't, yeah. doesn't meet my values. Um, I don't like it. I'm not happy. That feels very energy draining. It's just like, <laughs> exhausting. You feel yeah, exhausted, depleted. Anything else? I get a bit of, um, I don't know, anger. Yeah. I, I just don't agree with the way things are. And I think it's not the right thing to do or to treat people. So, yes, I love okay. So, you've got two models running at the same time, right? One is, I feel, well, no, that's all right. I'm empowered. And the other one is, I'm totally drained, exhausted, and I feel pretty angry about this. So you're stuck <laughs> between these emotions, right? You, you can't see a clear way forward. So you do some thinking, and then the the, the anger, the depletion, the exhaustion, those thoughts that are off, that are being offered to you by your brain stop you from taking the action that the empowered feeling is starting. Right? So that would be the result is going around in circles. So that's kind of that's your unintentional model. Mm. Right? So the work then would be how do we make that an intentional model? Those thoughts, I don't like this, I'm not happy, this doesn't align, are not serving you. They're just getting you stuck. The thought, I'm not changing my truth is serving you because it's making you feel empowered. So then the work is, let's explore that. What is your truth? What are your core values? What really matters to you? Who do you want to spend time with? Yes. <laughs> if you would like to, if you can, or if you don't have to share with the group, but then that's where then you will be able to see a path. Those questions then give you actions to take in order to create the result. Ah, oh, now I know what kind of job I need to do. Now I know how I want to spend my time. So that's where these vulnerabilities and emotions become so important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any, yeah, what did you say? What did you say? No, it's, it's very accurate. It's, it's very accurate. accurate. It gives yeah. you clarity. It's basically like um, the two emotions, which is like the word of like what you can get when you actually align with your truth. And then if you reach a specific like, and you're like going forward and coming back. And just, yeah. And you're stuck between them. So then you can see that, right? So just you can decide, right? Thanks. I get that. Thank you very much, Brain, but I don't need that anymore. Let's focus on these parts. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. So if you were to continue coaching uh, Anna, so you would explore the truth, right? Mm. Uh, Anna's truth, is that correct? Uh, yeah, right? Okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah. What other angle would you take? Curious. If you were to coach uh, Anna uh, more holistically? In terms of techniques. In terms of techniques. I think exploring the truth, I, I'm, I'm super, I would be, I can't, like, I'm just super curious now about what Anna's truth is. <laughs> um, and I think then, depending on, we discover more in the session about how the dissatisfaction is showing up for you and where it's limiting you. Quite often when you find those people who are stuck between two, two things, they'll be actually physical ways that the stress is showing up, right? Um, it might be gut health, it might be sleep, it might be ability to focus. Um, I need to get the actual clinical burnout diagnosed, so it actually burned, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. yeah, right, so there'll be way too much adrenaline and cortisol running through your body all the time, yeah. uh, and then trying to bring that down uh, is hard work, and having some dietary supplements to to deal with all of that. So I do work with clients in this way as well and work together with naturopaths and functional wellness um, practitioners and sleep experts to kind of manage all of that then and quite often before we then go on to, into the big work of what's next because we need to get you guys stable. 
and able then to make clear decisions, not reactive decisions. Okay. So that's how you would yeah. handle. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, have you ever had pushback against the CEO mindset? Uh, no. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> No, because I think most people who come to coaching wanted to start to take responsibility for their lives, right? Yes. So, yeah, yeah, if you try to coach somebody when you're not asked, maybe, but yes. <laughs> that's like 101 that you taught us, right, Jolene? Thank <laughs> like, you. Yeah. Um, we are in Singapore and uh, we have people from all over the world. Is there any cultural differences in the way you approach the CEO mindset? Um, I think what I like about this construct is that it's pretty culturally neutral. Mm. So we've talked about under the, the key elements for the, C, for the CEO mindset. Then the process for building it, developing it is ongoing. Uh, it has three key stages. You create, you evaluate, and you optimize. So see what I did there with the CEO, right? Um, <laughs> so those processes um, are pretty culturally neutral. Mm. What I see though that has cultural impact um, is particularly in cultures where there's a lot of rote learning, there's a lot of um, learning for the test, uh, there's a lot of conformity. There's quite, people can get stuck on the question, well, how should I be? As opposed to how do I want to be? Or how is it best to be? Um, and I think also this, the CEO mindset definitely does not play into people pleasing. And it definitely helps you to establish very loving and compassionate barrier, uh, boundaries. And that's something, again, that sometimes is a bit harder for women. Okay. I'm being culturally, I'm, being, I'm talking about what I've seen in my practice. Okay, I would love to explore this. Uh, so we have a bit of time now, and I'm sure we'll take questions, but I'd love to uh, hear a bit more about just, uh, how do you help people establish those boundaries, mm. emotional boundaries that are very important for this human mindset. Yeah, it's really interesting. When you, when you become very explicitly and consciously aware of the values that matter to you and why, it actually becomes surprisingly easy to say with love, thank you, but no. <laughs> it really does, and that's the power of of this. I think quite often you see that happen intellectually first, and there's the bit of the resistance to get it heartfelt where it's okay. People know what they want to do, they struggle a little bit to kind of get there. And it's this is the part, some of the work that I've done that I absolutely love because you'll see the client who's been struggling and going backwards and forwards and kind of getting there and getting there in their head, and then they'll do one small thing. They'll write an email where they've been asked to do something and say, you know what, actually, I don't think the, the best business decision in my view is. Or actually, that trip that you're asking me to go on, it would be better to do it at this particular point in time. They'll set one small boundary and suddenly it's done. And it just becomes, they realize that they can do it without being flooded with emotion. Mm with that zoomed out perspective mm -hmm. and able to make this best decision with these key parameters that I have explicit, explicitly developed and stated for myself. Okay, great. So as a coach, you enable this behavior and you mm -hmm. empower them to do these little steps for the creator, um, bigger step and bigger um, confidence to yeah. and create those boundaries. Yeah, and I think again that congruency comes in mm -hmm. because it's just a little boundary set at work. And then you go home, you're like, you can lovingly say to you, to, I'm taking this actually from the, from the client, to your husband, can you, would it be possible for you to play your music 
that loud, perhaps in the hour before I get home from the, from the office? Or is there a way that we can figure out how to share this workspace that we that we have at home? Because you think that I need space. That's my space and I need it. And how can we figure out where that works? And so it just shows up again in these different aspects and areas of life and almost without noticing this very organic, multi-dimensional model of growth and development. Um, where the expression of boundaries becomes available. Yeah. Thank you, Sasha. And for yourself, how do you personally continue to evolve um, and enhance your CEO mindset? Yeah, so I oh, I was just working on my self-concept like yesterday. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I think, and when you first introduce, introduce a self-concept, you know, quite often you'll start at the, with the sort of who am I question? What are the values and, and um, core beliefs most important to me? And that can start at, at, at quite a macro level. You look at the behaviors then that you want to show up with, like I said, you know, understanding, listening, collaborating, compassion, like wh whatever the, the behaviors are. And then you'll generally talk about some key goals that people will want to create in their lives with those behaviors. So it might be, um time with family it may be a specific salary that they have their own that they would like to earn and it may be specific projects that they want to execute on so you get this sort of broad brush goals um and a broad brush over here as the coaches understanding of their self-concept becomes more nuanced and more developed then you can actually okay so how do i want to show up as ceo at work and within this particular team and what are our particular goals and outcomes that we need for, for that as sort of a subset of the, the big wheel of, of goals that you've had initially. So that's where the work comes in really. You get to be more and more refined in stating, well, these are my core beliefs. I'll give you an example. Yes. I'll use me. My unintentional, unconscious self-concept from way back was if I'm the best, I'll be loved. I had tiger parents. So the behaviors that I and the values that were important to me were you know integrity, working hard, loyalty, perfectionism, judgment of others, competitive, not very kind sometimes. The results that I created in my life were stellar academic results, highly paid job, a small group of close friends, <clears throat> disordered eating. And so you can see how it, it feeds out into these unintentional results. Some are great, some are not. Fast forward three decades <laughs> and a key value or core belief for me is I am willing to be the most valuable asset in the group. It resonates with what I grew up with, but it's very nuanced. I'm willing to do it, even if it feels like shit, even if it means that I have to work really hard, even if actually I feel sick that day, but I need to be there, right? I'm willing, whether it feels good or bad to be the most valuable asset. What is valuable? Depends on context. Sometimes being the most valuable is doing nothing, being silent, listening, or offering a solution, or enabling somebody else to offer their solution, right? So you have an examination of what's value, valuable, an asset in itself inherently has worth, and it's something that you look after, nurture, take care of. So, that allows for self-care and compassion. So then as a result, <clears throat> still show up with integrity. I still am very hardworking, but I don't judge now. I can show up with a lot more compassion. I can show up with a lot of kindness. I can show up with a lot more self-care. I still have great results, but I also have time for me. I also have my health back. So that's a development of the self-concept. 
That's very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you, Tasha, for that. Uh, maybe, is there one thing that you want to share before we uh, take questions? One thing that you want to share, the team, the team, anything? One thing that I would share is really that this, what I love about this CEO mindset is that it is absolutely available to anybody, regardless of pay grade or title or what they're doing. Even if, you know, whether you're not in an office, it doesn't matter. So we're all our own CEO. It's available to us all. And it's a pretty, it's, if you're willing to make the decision to decide who you want to be, how you want to show up, and be very powerfully intentional in that, the results could be phenomenal. So I encourage everybody to just go on the exciting journey and discover their own CEO. Discover your own CEO. I love this one. Thank you. Okay, so let's take uh, questions. Yes, and, and uh, online, please feel free to use the chat huh, as well. I can check them. Yeah, so we have things for this. And this one is speaker. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to come back to your warning period about when you yes. left the job and uh, how you applied the CEO mindset. I can relate to that. I left a very high paid job um, in corporate in order to become an artist. But uh, my warning was more about okay, I don't have this budget to play around anymore. I don't have this access to talent. I don't have the responsibility anymore. Um, I felt like my impact is much less now and I don't have the same um, field of impact in which I can act being on my own. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, and I think a lot of people will leave corporate experience it, right? You just have all of these resources at exactly. your disposal. Yeah. And you have a brand behind you an awful lot of exactly. time, right? Yeah, and that it's needed every day. I mean, it's needed and it's impacting people. So, and then I was on my own and uh, I had to put in basically my own thing, but without the people, without the budget, and nobody asked me to do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's a really, challenging and humbling time, right? It's a quick story, because it is just quite amusing. I, I worked on the dealing floor, and if something went wrong with your computer and all your screens, you just sort of stood up and yelled, ID! And like three people would come and run, and you could still be on the phone, and they'd be like fixing stuff under the desk, and then you'd be up and off and away. And then when I started my own business at home, my printer broke. <laughs> And it took me a day to find somebody who could fix it. And then he came and he took it away in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I got it back like a week later, sort of fix. Um, so yeah, it's really humbling. And so the key question is, because and this is where this idea of self-worth worth and value comes to the fore and all as well. Because in corporate, in that role, you do not have the chance really or the opportunity to discover your value because you've had all well, what your feeling of self worth is, right? Because you had so much of it handed to you. So the key question is what if, what if you have everything that you need right now? Um, okay. Um, how do you apply that? <laughs> But I'm struggling with that one. <laughs> so there was a period in my life where um, I was running a, a successful business uh, and my marriage ended very quickly, very shockingly and very surprisingly. It turned out my financial situation was not at all when I came to I had to leave my own country, a new country with three small young children. I managed to find somewhere to live. But I could only afford some garden furniture to put inside the house for the first couple of months. Mm -hmm. It had no curtains on the windows. So I was rather confronted with the situation that all I had was what I'd got. Mm -hmm. So what if you have everything that you need right now? It's all here. Right. Yeah. 
And the emotion that got me through that was the gratitude for the opportunity to start Bootsa. I was so grateful to have the opportunity to start my life over with good values and good people and being able to look after my children. Well, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, okay. In, in, in yes. Relation here, sorry, you mentioned that you ran a successful business, mm -hmm. but the price to pay was you know, the relationship area. So, how did you make sure that beginning again, you won't revert back to that? Because it could be like you could fall in love with a success of business, right? So, how do you make sure you're not going to be this person again? Yeah. So, this is, I mentioned the three stages of, of the process for implementing or building or developing your CEO mm -hmm. mindset. First, you create your three-year, five-year, ten-year plan and your parameters within, within which you operate, your values, essentially, your core beliefs, your creed. The next stage of the evaluation is critical and it is ongoing. And there are two parts to it. One, I call radical self-inquiry. What are the thoughts and emotions that I'm bringing to the table? How are those impacting my, my actions and the results that then I'm creating in the world or I'm experiencing? In the world, do those align with my goals? Three year, five year, ten year plan. Do those align with my values? So this radical self inquiry is ongoing and keeps the ego in check, in check, very well. But then there's an evaluation tool that just looks at the results, and this I find incredibly powerful, and it's a, applicable to the small, small situations and it, it's super simple. What went well? What didn't? What would I do differently? Right? Can you do that on daily basis? Yeah, after every client calls on. I'll do it after this. And then with business decisions as well. It's just super, it's a great check-in. Another piece of piece on the evaluation is the second order thinking. That question and then what? Because you'll see the results that apparently are created in the world, but actually then look at the second order of results, and then what? And then what? Because are those actually the results? Well, I, it looks like a short-term success, but actually I've fucked it in the long term. So the, the final piece of it, I said two points. We talk in coaching quite a lot about having your board of directors. Um, quite often help to like come, serve to show us our blind spots or thinking ways that we don't. I would just add to that that I think in this case tension is a tension can provide a lot of balance. So your board of directors shouldn't just be able to, sh to see your blind spots. They should know your biases and they should be able to challenge them. So there's a lot of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable in all of that evaluation process. Actually, Ray Dalio talks about radical inquiry in his book, Principles. Um, he applies this, you know, he talks about very um, radical honesty and transparency in making investment decisions. You know, my work is a derivative of that, if you like, in that if you can be very radically honest with yourself about what it is you're doing and allow others to be so too. You get to evaluate, make sure that you stay on books, as you say, don't repeat, repeat the space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yes. Yes. Okay. No, no, I just want to be. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a yes. Question. Yes. How do you measure the success of your CEO mindset? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. How do you measure the success of your CEO mindset? And just for you guys uh, online, if you didn't hear, yeah. And I think it's a it's a very relevant question to coaching in general, yes. right? How do clients experience the value of coaching? How do they understand the value of, of the coaching? And I think up front, it's quite, it can be hard. It's actually easier in some of my projects because people will come to me with business development challenges or opportunities. So we will, you know, agree success metrics, KPIs, um, 
and of course the smart goals, right? Specific, measurable. You, you guys are doing all of that, all of that stuff. Um, so measurable results is, is really important. I think one thing that people with the CEO mindset in particular that shows up every single time, two things show up every single time, increased energy to the burnout point and increased time. And it's actually for a really simple neuroscientific reason. If you've got very clear on who you want to be and how you're going to do that, You've given your brain one thing to think about and one way to be. A lot of us, are, it's the spinning plates running around. Oh, I have to be mom. I have to be CEO. I have to be the, the daughter. I have to be the friend. I have to be the colleague. But if we show up very congruently, it's such not a draining way to be, right? The draining piece for you, Anna, is that it, this doesn't mesh with who I am and who I want to be. So when we show up with congruence, the, the energy and the brain depletion um, is reduced in very, very noticeable ways. So you will also see people sleeping a lot better. And I would go so far as to say reversing out of, I'm getting into epigenetics now, but stress factors will turn on genetic responses, right? So you will see whatever genetic response people will, will have to stress reversing out of that, which is fascinating. Yeah, Jen. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the best use of self-discovery for decision making and um, congruency? Self-concept, self-concept. So when you spoke about the concept, you spoke about values. Yeah. Have you got any tips on how you identify your values? I know this sounds like a very basic question. So like what your real values are, because I know there's values what you think they are. Then you look at your action, and they're like, actually, my values are bad. So any tips on how to really hone down on what the real values are? Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. Actually, Geraldine it does a great one. <laughs> <laughs> like who, who do you like right we did oh, we did. yes we did it but it's one uh, among many it's one among ways but it's a fun way to do it yeah. um so that's a really good one and also Brene brown has a list of values which you can print from the internet i love her work because there is so much data that and research that's gone into it and she has this great list of values some of which you wouldn't actually have thought would be values. Her research shows that they are held as values by that many people. And so they, they just help you to sort of think around it a little bit. Um, I think where, if you find yourself in circumstances where you're having a very emotional response, using the model to, if you're, you know, circumstance, somebody says something and it, whether it's anger, resentment, whatever it is, sadness, or fear, whatever that is, spending a little bit of time thinking, what are the thoughts that are creating that response in me will uncover? Well, I don't like that because I think people should be kind. Well, that makes me really uncomfortable because it seems really risk-taking and actually security is really important, I think. So using that that life critical model just to help structure that that does better process we really useful. Thank you, Jenja. Thank you, Sasha. Yes, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. When you create your CEO mindset, it's uh, it start with an individual uh, work. Uh, and how do you validate or share your CEO mindset because we don't live alone. And so if we just produce something by ourselves, then the chances of success are limited because our success is dependent on the environment we live in and with. So once you create, so the question is, do you create it by yourself? which I think is 
pretty much uh, uh, the starting point. But I take an analogy with a CEO in a company who we create a vision, different things, value, but there will be a board of director, there will be people who will, in fact, it's a co-creation world. So how, where do you strike the balance between the CEO mindset, which is your creation, and how do you inject the co-creation element? Because you don't live by yourself. So I have two responses to that. On an individual level, when you start showing up with well thought out behavior, you are resonating with the world around you, right? And you can look at the results that you're creating and think, well, is that working or not? Am I getting generating that outcome that I'm desiring? Or me for the people that, that I love, for the people in my unit. So there's a there's a resonance, there's a feedback which help which is relevant. What is really cool about the self-concept model. Um, and I've done this with a few clients, is yes, you build it for yourself, but you can take it to your teams. I mean, okay, guys, what are the values that matter to us in this room? How do we want to behave together? What are, are our key goals in terms of outcomes? And then you may have to keep some from higher up business plan in mind, or it may be just beside it depends on the corporate situation, right? But that's the beauty of that self -insert. I was I was thinking, like you said about the relationship with work, which uh, is one component, but I was also thinking about the relationship of family, the connection with the family, if you have a family, and then, it's probably the same answer is how do you share it? Because at some point, especially in the cycle of a family, you need to have a, a model which is a CEO mindset of a family, right? So that's probably the extension of it, but it's the same answer, I guess, that, like yeah. you said, with work. Yeah. And it's a wonderful parenting tool. Right? I mean, you don't have to sit there and draw circles with your, with your family and say, right, here are our values in the middle, and this is how we behave. But being able to have the conversation with one's kids, I use it all the time. Like, our family values are, like, for us, loyalty is a thing. I mean, the boys and I, my, I have three sons. We call ourselves the unit. <laughs> right? So the unit has particular values. We really come on the thing up. And it makes it very easy to have the conversation with them. Well, guys, you know that this behavior is acceptable, you know that that is not. Thank and the you. most annoying parenting question of all what are you trying to achieve? <laughs> <laughs> you can take this one. <laughs> all right, we'll take one last question. Uh, yeah. we read this. I am so cool. I want to build on a couple of things that the, the friends here have been sharing. Where where you were saying that value, what's in is everything is in this, right? You have final values, even if we don't have the big neon lights of a big corporate, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, it's all about us. While we are finding that value, how do we continue? Because you don't really find that purpose, the newer purpose, so fast. But sometimes the clock is ticking. Unless you've the one who decided in five years' time I'm going to leave the corporate, okay, you can have five years to find the value. At times, the clock could be a month, it could be two months. In the meantime, you can stay or you can go, and you want to find that newer, bigger purpose that has driven and made you so successful so far. What's your approach or thought or methodology? Lack of a better word, accelerate that. Bigger purpose finding, but not rushing it and yet taking time as well. Yeah. So we talked about purpose with a little P already, right? Yes. So looking at well, what matters to me about this situation, what matters to me about that situation, and and just being very consciously aware of who you're enjoying spending time with or what you're enjoying spending time doing. But this is also 
another key question that I ask potential coaching clients is how much time and effort are you willing to put into doing this? Because it's probably five times as much as you think it's going to be. Right? And sometimes it's just hard. And sometimes we have to keep doing a job that we don't like until we figure it out. If that's short way, sometimes we have to find something temporary. I mean, those those are the realities of our, of our world. And having a CEO mindset doesn't mean that those don't go away. But while we're doing that, knowing that we have the tools to figure it out and that we have everything inside of it means that I know I'm going to get there. The resilience is a great thing. It's probably not like the funnest answer, but it's the most pragmatic in my experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and it's time, uh, Dr. Stebel, I think, has uh, to have some constraints. So thanks a lot, Sasha. Thank you for having me. Uh, insightful. So many uh, new uh, tools, techniques, things to think about, and references as well, and which uh, that on uh, Brooke Castillo, uh, Red Ayu, and uh, many other uh, techniques that you can share with you. One last word. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you also online, guys. Thanks a lot. Yes. I'll see you soon.